Thank you all. This is, after all, the Atlantic Air Summit. Yes. And we've been talking about a number of things, that environmental concerns that we found and we've seen, research has told us about. This is where the rubber meets the road, I guess. And Dr. Huntington, I would start with you on this. Bring, make the connection for us. Do we know that we are seeing lung cancer connected to the air we breathe? Yes, uh, the WHO has now come out and said clearly that um, air quality plays a role in lung cancer. Uh, not as high a role in the U.S. as in uh, emerging nations, but it is a factor in lung cancer development. And realize that today, while 90% of lung cancers are related to either current or former smoker, 10%, which is over 20,000 people a year, are developing lung cancer that have never smoked a day in their life. And we didn't see 1,000 lung cancers before the 20th century in a year. Um, Chris Draft, you created your foundation in honor of a woman who was part of that statistic, who never smoked, yes. had no reason to think, your bride that you lost after only a few weeks of marriage. Yeah, so, I mean, it's amazing. So lung cancer, I think when you, when you, when you think of it, you absolutely think about the connection with smoking. Uh, I think, you know, with us being here, you can add on to the connection with, with air quality. But, uh, you know, my wife, never a smoker, uh, was in amazing shape, 37 years old, and, and is diagnosed with lung cancer. And so out of nowhere that, uh, you know, you find that out and you realize that, you know, what people have talked about. I grew up in California, so absolutely in terms of air quality, that's, that's been a, that was always a huge uh, uh, point of emphasis along with smoking levels. California was one of the first ones, uh, you know, followed up by, by Illinois because of Chicago, but in 1998, you know, uh, of dealing with smoking issues. Um, but uh, the story is bigger than that. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've had to, to deal with as it relates to lung cancer is that, you know, it's absolutely great that we continue to do the things as it relates to air, air quality. We have to do that. Indoor, outdoor air quality, we have to do that. But the story of lung cancer is bigger than that because it's the same as cancer in general. And that is that prevention is absolutely imperative, but that's not the whole, the whole story. The game plan is prevention, early detection, treatment, research, and survivorship. Which is the perfect point in which to speak to Jill Feldman, who is the poster child for early screening, right? Sort of, yes, I would say. Um, you know, I, you had a lot of family history. I do. I, when I was 13, I lost two grandparents to lung cancer, and then six, six months later, my dad. Um, and then in my 20s, both my mom and her sister, my aunt, died of lung cancer. And so needless to say, I was bitter and angry. And at, there were two things that I could do at the time. And one was um, get involved and make a difference and provoke change. And the other was try to get screened for lung cancer. At the time, there, they didn't think there was any family history. They said, well, former smokers are in, you know. Uh, but you weren't a smoker. You... Smoke. I am a non-smoker. I mean, I had my fun in college for a couple of years. <laughs> but, so, truth, true confessions. Truth, well, yeah, I always tell the truth. Um, but so any, if you ever inhaled anything, you are not a never smoker. So, it, so then they call you a non or a virtual smoker. But I remember when I first got screened and you know, my, when my mom was diagnosed, I was just saying, come on, I understand cigarettes are bad for you, but my point was also had to do with air pollution. The industrial revolution happened the same time cigarettes were invented. So how many of those people would have gotten, you know, lung cancer anyway? So I did insist on a scan, and I was 27 years old, and so nine years later, I, I didn't want my kids to ever go through what I went through. They found a nodule, and we watched it for a couple of years, and yeah, it, it was found early. I was the you know poster child of early detection, the story of hope that so many lung cancer patients and their family needed. Unfortunately, the cancer kept coming back. So 
while I'm not, you know, early detection didn't result in a cure for me, it has certainly made a difference and will continue to make a difference because I can live with it as a chronic disease for now. We have learned, Dr. Howington, so much, but not enough. Yes. We have learned, as Jill referenced, um, about that, that spike in lung cancers in this country that happened. I mean, you can see a clear connection between industry in the United States, our personal habits. Yes, so there's no question. So as I mentioned, in the 19 teens and 20s, lung cancer was such a rare disease that there were case presentations about this new process, this new disease. Um, and then when you had cigarettes being mass produced and the match, and then cigarettes being placed into rations for World War II and World War II vets, um, you saw this spike um, in lung cancer rates in men and then lung cancer rates in women after the 60s mm -hmm. in the Virginia Slim ads. Um, with tobacco control, we've seen a drop in the incidence of lung cancer, so the rate per 100,000, but the prevalence of lung cancer continues to climb because the average age for lung cancer is 67, and more and more of the baby boomers are hitting that age. And so the actual prevalence has gone up in my career from 175 or 180,000 cases to 225,000 cases a year. So lung cancer is not going away. 225,000 cases yes. a year of lung cancer. And so, and 10% of those people never, like, Jill never smoked, aren't former smokers, and so, the what need what for surprises resources. people when you tell them about this prevalence of lung cancer compared to other diseases that we are quite aware of? Well, first off, many people don't realize that it's the number one cancer killer in men and women, far and away. More women die from lung cancer than breast, ovarian, or uterine cancer combined. Um, more men die from lung cancer than prostate cancer or colorectal cancer. So, you know, more men get prostate cancer, but more men are dying from lung cancer. So, it still needs to be the fourth round of what we're thinking about and what we're studying and what we're trying to prevent. Chris Trafty, your foundation is about that. Education is about helping people to understand. Absolutely. I, I think uh, when, you, when you look at lung cancer, people say that there's a, a smoking stigma that goes along with that. And, and, it's, and it's true. I mean, you know. Smoking stigma because smoke. somehow it would have to be your fault. Oh, well, it, yeah. And it's, and it's, you were smoking. Somehow it's your fault. There's, a commercial, there's commercials that, that have come out that have said, hey, if you smoke and you, it, and so many th people think that there's a lack of awareness. So if I talk to a lot of the advocates, they say there's a lack of awareness. And I said, well, it's not really a lack of, of awareness. It's a lack of complete awareness. Mm -hmm. So when we look at lung cancer, lung cancer is pretty much the only cancer that it's been in schools that you would talk about, in health class that you would talk about. But it was only talked about from prevention. It was only talked about from not smoking. That was it. Right? Again, we, we've talked about some of the air quality issues that were absolutely important. Again, I know for me in California, that was always a big, big issue. We, if we saw the mountains, oh my goodness, it was a good day. You know, now you can, you can see them a lot more. But it, it's, it's a huge issue because really the stigma is tied to only a prevention campaign. It is tied to, to it just being about prevention and that's all you can do. So if you could get somebody excited about wanting to do something about lung cancer, or caring about somebody with lung cancer, they would just go directly to something that's environmental. They would say, yes, we got to get people to stop smoking, absolutely. Yes, we got to do something from air quality, absolutely. But they don't talk about the importance of early detection. And so, you know, we have a thoracic surgeon here that, that does tremendous work as it relates to from CT scans that can do early detection, but the group that can benefit from that the most are veterans, our veteran community. I mean. You know, these are people that we should care about. And, then it's, and it's absolutely clear that they didn't just start smoking just because. You know, they, they were giving them in their ration packs. They're in Vietnam, and they said, here, you got them, smoke them. And like so many things, the, the, the cigarettes, you know, we don't want to think about where the history is of it, but they got indicted not that long ago for predatory marketing, for adding more additives to make it more addicting. So when you look at somebody that has lung cancer, too often they look at, look at them and they say, well, they did it to themselves. Mm. And, they, and they, they, they don't see them as a victim. But essentially, they are a victim. They're a victim of a, of a system that embraced that. You know, they're a victim of a, a system that in certain areas with air quality. There right. is a, and, and we're not as aware of that. We're not as aware of those environmental factors. Well, no, and I think too that they're, you know, 
like I think Harold said earlier, two, you know, a couple of years ago, I think two years ago, you know, World Health Organization declared outdoor air pollution as a leading cause of lung cancer. But again, it shifts back to the only cause that people see is, you know. So when you say to somebody, oh, I have lung cancer. Well, yes, I do. And, and people ask me if I have lung cancer, or when I say I have lung cancer, you know, the first question people say is not, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, how can I help? It's, oh, how long did you smoke? So immediately patients lose any type of empathy, sympathy, and feel like they need to be on the defense. So years ago, there, I mean, you go back 15 years, there were no walks or runs. There were no lung cancer support communities. There were no lung cancer organizations, really, that were out there advocating and providing support. There was no lung cancer community at all. And so I think that we're doing a better job with showing our faces and telling the real story of lung cancer now because we have an incredibly large... There's also, though, more hope, as it were. I mean, everything I read about you says Jill Feldman is changing yeah. the face of lung cancer. Why is that? So I think it, a couple of reasons. It's twofold. The face of, you know, I was 39 years old when I was diagnosed. Um, so showing it can happen to anyone. You have lungs, you are at risk. That's what that face. And then the other face is you know, it's different. I mean, I may have followed in my family footsteps, but I never would have used the word hope seven, eight years ago, ever, when it came to lung cancer. Now I have it tattooed on my arm to remind me there is hope. Why? Because, you know, again, my incurable lung cancer was caught at a point where we can manage it because there are targeted therapy for lung cancers that are driven by a mutation. And there's also, you know, for me, targeted radiation that when you have cancer that returns, you can use a very targeted, you know, radiation therapy to, you know, essentially kill those individual cancers. They didn't have that years ago. So it's really, there is hope and it's moving fast, not fast enough but it's moving. And doctor, what we're talking about here is also changing what we think of as treatment for lung cancer. We're not necessarily talking about we're going to cure you. Well, both if you have early detection, yeah. if you look at all the screening trials, 80% of the people that have a screening detected lung cancer are cured. So five years out or further have no lung cancer. So that changes the paradigm for lung cancer. So many people don't get screened because like my siblings who are current or former smokers, they're worried that as soon as they get the diagnosis, it's a death sentence, and it's not. We need to get that out to the public, that if you have a screen-detected lung cancer, there's an 80% chance you'll be cured. So that's the first message. The second is, even if you present with an advanced stage, today, as she mentioned, we're finding more and more targets that have specific drugs that go towards that. So there's that being a genetic risk, for lung cancer, but that's also having a genetic mutation in the cancer that's driving that growth. And we have specific targets like EGFR, like ROS1, for those drivers and target those drivers that don't impact normal cells. So it's targeted therapy that's less toxic to the patient. So, and if we can change it from a fatal in six months disease to a chronic disease, like we change the face of AIDS. We don't cure AIDS, but people live a long time and live productive lives and- And maybe have a chance, chance. at something Some, else. Yes, yeah, so correct. All right, just as Jill is, uh, any questions out in the audience? I know we're running low on time, but I mm. just wanted to make sure people didn't have that opportunity. That, that really is for you, the mission here. Yeah. Make this, it's not that you're going in for your screenings or treatments thinking this is gonna be the day. And that, that involves a change, a mindset change. It, it does, and it was really hard for me after I was diagnosed with, you know, more advanced after the first couple of surgeries I had. But, you know, I look back, 
My dad died three months after diagnosis, and my mom died six months after diagnosis. So, <clears throat> excuse me, had we had any of these treatments, my dad could have lived two weeks to see me graduate eighth grade, or my mom could have lived six, you know, longer than six months to uh, see the birth of my daughter. Or Chris's wife. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> You know, we, we got married uh, essentially a month before, before my wife passed away. And uh, again, she was 37 years old, was, was challenged me to do P90X and run a 10K with her. I mean, you know, and I say that. This was a healthy, strong woman. She was woman. healthy, she was strong. Anyone can get it. I mean, and, and you know, I say that, uh, and that's hard for people to, to grab a hold of. Now, a lot of the work that we've done in changing the face of lung cancer is to make sure that it doesn't have to come into your house before you believe that. That you don't have to, you know, if, if Jill says if you have lungs, you can get it, that that doesn't just sound like a, a line, but that you believe it. Uh, because if you do, now, you can help in accelerating the change that's happening. And there's absolute change. So over the last five years, I've been able to see it with the amount of survivors that, uh, that have, uh, you know, that they're increasing, the, 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 that the lives that, you know, that they're, they're extending, and the amount of moments that they, they're able to enjoy. Uh, in 2011, my wife was going through, the year that she was going through it, two of the biggest changes happened in lung cancer. And that was a lung cancer screening trial, but also the uh, validation of the second targeted, targeted therapy, which uh, completely changed, changed the game in lung cancer. And so uh, our mission has been in changing the face of lung cancer to make sure people see the hope. They've got to see it. I mean, we can't just talk about it, but they've got to see it. I mean, Jill is, is right here. She is hope. <laughs> you know, somebody says, how do you know things are changing? Because I see Jill right here. Because I see other survivors right there. And on the other side of it, I also know that my wife passed after one year. So anybody that is living longer than that, I know something has changed. It's changing. But again, we have to continue to accelerate it. But there are a lot, there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of people working on it right now. And that is a good note for us to close on. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.